discover the career of your dreams, learn how to get your foot in the door, stand out, and create the life you desire. This is our time. This is our adventure. Together, you and I will explore the world, discover what's possible, and eradicate wasted potential from existence. I'm Siobhan Colleen. This is Industry Explorers. Let's move on to certified negotiator, certified interrogation based, certified read interrogation, and certified human intelligence collector. Those are all things that you did during your time in the military. Uh, did you get those while you were in the military, or is that something you got as a civilian? So I got them in the military, but they're civilian courses. So read is a uh, interview technique. It's predominantly used inside of the police force and it's used, there's a basic and advanced version and it's used to aid in those kind of crime investigation interviews, right? It's kind of what you see on TV, right? Getting, getting to the confession. And so it's very much driven and based towards that. So I will say every interrogation and interview technique that I've learned does have parallels to business, right? Because at the end of the day, everything is communication. So if you're a project manager and you're interviewing who's going to be your supplier, it's kind of good to to be able to know how to question them and get to the desired outcome of, are they the best deal? Are they the best product? Are they somebody you would trust to work with, right? Like those interview techniques still help there. Now, am I I trying to get them to confess to me that they committed a crime? No, not at all. But I, I do want to know, that they are the right person for the job. And so um, the ba- usually, but like I said, predominantly it's used inside of the police force. Um, a lot of police are certified in it. Uh, it's based out of Chicago. So a lot of Chicago PD, obviously an area with very high crime, they have those certifications and their detectives use it to help them aid in case counts. Um, they're, a lo- they're a longstanding organization. They've been around for a long time, training military and police all over. So super great organization, if that's something you're interested in, right? That's a route you want to go down. It's definitely not a bad one. Maybe even if someone's looking to go into the police force. Are those certifications that you can get outside of having a job? So say you're not a police officer yet, or you're not a deputy sheriff yet, or you're not in one of those roles. Can you still pursue those certifications to make you more marketable as you work towards those roles? I would think that you can. I Like I said, I was an interrogator when I got it, so I had kind of the, the need for it, but... I don't see why you could, you know what I mean? Because if you know, if you know you want to be a detective, then you should be able to start taking steps towards that, just like anything else in life, right? If I know I want to be better at my finances, I can take Dave Ramsey's financial piece. I can take, uh, you know, to whoever else's financial course to to make me better at it. So I, I think you can. Don't don't hold me to that, but I definitely think you can. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. After you listen to this podcast, it's a if that's something you're interested in, it's a you know, go do your research. You can just go to their website. They have a, a website. It's got all of it. It's got laid out where the classes are and things like that and how to apply. Can you do a good Bostonian accent? Not even. Not even a little bit. Can you give it a try? The cocky. The, the khakis? Can I? Here, I'll try it with you. I left my khakis in my khakis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see? Like, I got a wicked problem. I have no idea what accent I'm doing. I always think of the movie The Town. I don't. I haven't seen it, no. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's got like Ben Affleck and uh, who's Jeremy Renner. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's super awesome, right? And then like, I always think of that scene where he's like, well, whose car are we taking? You know, and I'm like, oh, that's super cool. But I have a horrible Boston accent. Is that is Adam Sandler, does he do a Boston accent? Because I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm even doing a Boston accent. I think I'm, uh, I, I think I'm doing an Adam Sandler, uh, a really bad impression. I'm sorry. I feel like I've just disrespected him. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like I feel like I can only be respectful to Boston by saying that like, I suck at a Boston accent. But I love the movies about Boston, like the the crime movies and the gritty thrillers. Because this is really important for my next question. Can you tell us what a Wicklander Z- Z- Zulowski certification is? A Wicklander Zule? It's a wicked Wicklander Zulowski certification. I got the basic and the advanced. I. Guys, I'm telling I you, am, I'm, I love look, it. Let me just say, <laughs> I'm a Cali girl. Dude, I'm a Cali girl. All right. So I am sorry for offending the entire East Coast just now. Yeah, I'm from Texas. I say y'all. That's about like, 
I'm not going to hit either coast accent, and I'm definitely not going to do them any justice. Dude, you want to go get the In-N-Out later? <laughs> I love In-N-Out, so there's one down the road. Come on. Yeah. I'm a huge fan. And, but I offend all the Texas people because I like In-N-Out over Whataburger, and that's a crime out here. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe we got that on tape. I know. Uh, yeah. Can we edit Can we edit that out? Can we edit that? Everyone's going to see it. Nope. <laughs> all right. So... For realsies this time, what is a Wicklander Zulowski certification? I have never heard of that. Yeah, so it's another similar, it's used a lot in police, and that one is actually focused more on the written statement, right? So it's focused on when you have people write out their confessions and things like that. So you can tell, I use this a lot in business, and I'll get to the business piece in a minute, but, but when you're writing it, when people write statements, areas that they you know, put a lot of emphasis on, put a lack of emphasis on the type of verbiage they use. If there's just a random change in the verbiage, if there's a change in the style of handwriting, right? Those tell you all kinds of different things about the person. The best parallel for business and the way that I use this in business is when you write your mission statement, are you writing a good, clear mission statement? And then does your mission statement reflect into your business and everything that you're doing? And for some organizations, it does. For others, it doesn't. But at the end of the day, those written statements are just as valuable as the things that you say, if not even more valuable, because people are going to translate them in their own head, right? Like they're going to see them and there's no context for you to rebut or anything like that unless they reach out to you. So are you saying and capturing what you want, right? And not just from the point, like you can download the Grammarly app and it'll tell you, is this a friendly statement? Is this like an assertive statement, right? Like you can do all that, right? And that's a piece of it, of those statement analysis. But also, you know, like, is it, is it true? Did you put enough emphasis in the right area? And those are all things that from that end, they use it for confessions and to make sure that someone isn't agreeing to something that they didn't really do and things like that. But it does have business applications as well. And I think that's been the coolest part of all the certifications that I've got is to see how they apply into the everyday business world. Do you mind blessing us with some writing tips as it applies to the principles of effective communication? Yeah. You know, uh, tip one, be honest or just don't write it, right? (laughs) Just tell the truth. For whatever reason, if you're writing something, you know, choose to use language that fits you. Because if you try to put in words that aren't really to you, like, you know, like those people who try to put like, um, posthumously or or whatever into their daily conversation and it doesn't really fit them, it becomes apparent. Just like when you say a word in a conversation, it sounds awkward. It'll, it'll write out awkward as well. Right. And when you're on a computer, you know, you can obviously type through it and it, you know, you can't see the handwriting in type, but truthfully, yeah, if that that piece is big, but then also pay attention to what you're putting emphasis on. If you're putting all your emphasis on a specific piece of the conversation, determine whether you're doing that because you're trying to deflect from another part, right? So if if you're writing a mission statement and you put a lot of emphasis on, you know, to the customer, but you put no emphasis on your, your product creation, is that because you're not very good at your product offering? Is that because you don't feel confident in your product offering? Or is it because you truly care more about the customer. Maybe you make the whole thing about the customer and you eliminate the product piece from it, right? So really and truly the key to those statements inside of a business or inside of your day-to-day life is, are you putting the focus in the right place? So when a person is trying to steer a, a written statement a different way, they will put focus on certain things. Like Maybe they'll put a lot of emphasis on what they did getting up in the morning, but then at the time of the crime, they put like as few details as possible, right? And so that's just like a criminal aspect. But but think about it inside of your regular life. If you're writing a card to a friend, you're going to put focus on the things you care a lot about, and you're going to breeze over that other area. And I think the key to it is to really ask yourself, why are you breezing over that area? Are you breezing over it because that's not you, then maybe you don't even include it at all, right? Are you breezing over it because that's something you know you don't do very well? Well, maybe that's something you need to take away as an action to get better at, right? And so I think that's really the key to it. Like, 
just like anything, it's analysis, right? Like you can look at a written statement, you can do these things, but you have to analyze. You have to really sit down and say, is this what I wanted it to say? And then like I said, the, the analyst, the third piece is read back over what you wrote. Does it make sense? And not just like the grammatical, like all of that, like spell check and F7 can cover you, right? Like that's fine, but read over it and really ask yourself. And it's the same thing I say in communication, like verbal is do that after action review. Is it going to do the thing I intended it to do? Right. And think through it. Are any pieces of this conversation, something that could be misinterpreted, misconstrued, right? And, and I do it in every conversation I have. And I try to review them and say, did I do this right? Did I do that right? How can this help me be better? Like this conversation, we have, we've talked about tons of topics. So when I listen to it again and review it, I'm going to take away things, things I didn't do well and things I did really well, because there's going to be, there's going to be pieces of both. And that's true for anyone in any conversation. And so, and especially when you write it out, because like I said, once it goes out, you can't control how the other person translates it. So you have to think about that inside of that initial writing. And if you're an organization, it's even more important, right? Because people are, people are going to remember your mission statement or your key phrase, right? Like if you see the Nike check, the first thing you think about is just do it, right? Like it's the same thing for any organization. So like my, like Blue Sphinx Consulting, success through communication. Now, if my, if my motto is success through communication, is everything I'm doing mimicking that? And if it isn't, does, does the, do my written statements on my website mirror that? Do they not? If they don't, I need to make sure that either A, I change my mission statement because I'm not living up to it, or B, I need to figure out how to put those two in sync because that's the biggest problem people have. It's not that we don't know how to write great things. Like we have Grammarly, we have all these great things that tell us how to write amazing. The problem is, are we effectively writing what we do? what we want to do, who we want to be, where we want to be. Thank you. Those are, that was a lot. I like, I, that's all I can say is thank you. I hope our listeners take away a lot from this podcast. I feel like that scene in Moana, I want to be like, you're welcome. All I can say is that you're welcome. I was listening to a couple of podcasts in which you were the guest and you were talking about what it means to be an effective communicator. And a big takeaway was that you need to be a good listener. You need to be a good listener. You need to be able to like relay the information back to someone because that does two things. It ensures that you understood them correctly and it allows them to correct you if you didn't. And number two, when you sprinkle bits of conversation, bits of previous conversation into your current conversation, that also lets the person know that you you listened to them, you heard them, and it makes them feel important. It makes them feel good. And people are going to remember how you made them feel. So I had a question while I was listening to you being a guest on these couple of podcasts. How do you stay engaged in a, in a conversation with someone who is just uninteresting, dull, or monotonous? Yeah, it's funny because I actually, I was talking about that with Eric Corum the other day and he, um, his podcast, The Blueprint, I highly recommend it. It's a great podcast, but I digress. Point being is he, you know, we we got to talking about it and we were using the example of, you know, when you have a kid, you have play dates, your kid and your, you are meeting with these other parents and you sometimes don't find them interesting or you don't want to be around them or whatever. Right. And truthfully, that comes from, so I like to say there's three big things in communication. One is planning how you're going to communicate. Two is safety in communication. And the point that I want to make to that is you can either create safety or you can take it away. Now, predominantly, people outside of the military should not be looking to take safety out of a conversation. We should, and in fact, even in the military, most times you're looking to bring safety into the communication. And so if someone is boring or uninteresting or doesn't want to talk to you a lot, that's really that part two right there. They don't really feel safe in that conversation. They don't feel comfortable to talk to you. They're giving you short answers because they don't, they don't, for whatever reason, they don't feel like they should give you more. Now that could be your body language that cause subconsciously you could like, they could say, I like Star Trek and you'd be like, I love Star Trek. I hate Star Trek. Right? Like that could, that could be what's happening. 
or you could not be focusing on rapport with them, or you could just be irritated that you have to do the play date and they can sense that irritation, right? So that's kind of where those nonverbal communication keys go in. But I, I like to say those are important, but don't focus on that because a lot of people like that's all they want to do, right? Is they want to, they want to avoid the foot tapping and the arm crossing and things like that. While that's a major part of the conversation, the other piece is actually having that conversation. And that's where the part one, the planning goes into it, right? If you know you're going to to engage in a conversation or even you don't know you're going to engage in a conversation, you should be thinking about what your communication style is. Am I an introverted communicator or am I an extroverted communicator? Do I, you know, try to dominate conversations or am I just kind of, you know, letting the other person take the reins? Because the person may not be bored. They may be irritated that they have to run the conversation. They may not be a person who likes to run conversation and you don't like to run conversation. So now you're both at this impasse thinking that you're both like irritated with each other and you don't like each other when truth of the matter is neither of you just really want to run a conversation, right? So with that said, you still have to be willing to step outside of your comfort zone at times because those scenarios are occasionally going to occur where someone is like you or not like you, right? So the inverse can happen, right? Two extroverted people are communicating and both want to dominate the conversation. So they think the other person isn't listening because the other person is trying to talk over them all the time. Well, truthfully, that person is just, they, they just like to talk and they want to be talking, right? So, so you have to understand what is the individual and you have to think through those scenarios. Like, how would I respond to somebody who's an extroverted communicator? How would I respond to somebody who's an introverted communicator? How do I respectfully tell someone, hey, like, let me finish this. Or how do I link that conversation to what they're talking about? Right? Like how do I, cause again, now we're creating safety in that conversation. We're giving person a person a way to be their true selves, feel how they want to feel, communicate how they want to communicate. And at the same time, we're giving ourselves safety in the communication to, to operate the way we want to. Right? So there's, I think there's no such thing as a bad conversation or a boring conversation. There's just our own preconceived notions that make it that way, right? Like I may not like talking about Star Trek, but someone who talks about Star Trek may all of a sudden go into like, you know, Picard being a great leader. And now all of a sudden we're talking about leadership and that's my realm, right? So, so I have to find the way to pull into the conversation what interests me to a certain degree. Like if I don't feel comfortable with that conversation, I don't tell the person, hey, this topic is stupid. We don't talk about it, right? Like. I guess you can, right? Again, that's pulling safety from the conversation. I wouldn't recommend it if you want to have the conversation, but uh, you know, I try to gear it that way. And when I see something that that I like in that conversation, maybe I try to latch onto that and show that person that that's my interest, or say, yeah, you know, I'm not really a fan of Star Trek because I've just never really seen how it's a, a it, the show doesn't make any sense, right? And maybe all of a sudden they start talking about, well, here's how time travel works and this and that, and I'm like. Oh, well, you know, I still don't see how it makes sense, but wow, it's pretty cool that you know a lot about that. And like, there's always something you can pull from a conversation. It's just our problem is we either choose not to, or we think it's the other person's responsibility to make us enjoy the conversation. When conversations are a two-way street, like you have to make the other person want to be a part of the conversation just as much as they have the responsibility to make you feel like you're part of the conversation. Because the moment you engage in talking to somebody, it's a bridge. It's a gateway. And you both have parts in it, right? Like I can close the door on our conversation right now. Like you could ask me about communication. I could just say, yeah, you know, you just got to build a safe environment. You could be like, well, how do you build that? And then I'm like, well, you know, you just be nice and respectful, right? Like, and th- that gets you nowhere. But if I give you things to pull off of, now you can find a piece of it that you resonate with. And then now you start resonating with me and we start vibrating, we start sinking and all of a sudden beautiful things start happening, right? Like there's no other way to say it than this, this beautiful medley starts to occur because the things you like start meshing into the things that I like and we start going down a different route. And then we realize like no matter what the topic is, we're really not that different, but it takes us stepping into it. I love that in the example you provided when you were responding to the pretend person discussing time travel with you with regards to Star Trek and your pretend response was, oh, I still don't understand it, but I think it's really cool that you know so much about it. That's another thing we haven't discussed is you validated that person. You you validated and empowered them. And that is a very powerful thing in conversation, even if it's a conversation you're not enjoying. Well, that's safety, 
That's safety because I may not like Star Trek, but I empowered them to know that I care about the conversation with them. So they may go, okay, he doesn't like Star Trek. Now let me try something else, right? But if I just close them off at the gate, they're not even going to try. And then I'm going to be like, well, this person's rude and they don't want to talk to me. Were they rude or were you just not trying to talk to them, right? Like, And it could be the other way around. They could really be making it hard for you. And there are just some people, like I do have to preface, there are some people who just don't want to give you an in no matter what, right? And you can try, but at least when you finish that conversation, you can say, I did everything possible to try to have that conversation. And then that goes to my third point, reviewing your conversation, right? These are the three pillars of communication. When you're reviewing that conversation, you can reflect back and say, did I do everything possible to try to communicate with them? Yes, I did. But you know what? I might could have done this and it might have elicited this response, right? You can walk out those scenarios and you can walk them out as many times as you want in your head. You can replay them all those different ways and you're going to learn from them and you're going to grow from them and you're going to become better. And it applies to relationships. It applies to business. It applies to you know police interrogation. It applies to military interrogation. It all applies because communication is something we all do and we all think we're effective at it, but truly very few people are. We hire coaches for breath work. We hire coaches for fitness because we don't know everything about it. The same thing is true for communication. We don't know everything about it and just predominantly. And just because we have conversations all day does not mean we're having effective conversations all day. It's not until we start reviewing those conversations and saying, did I achieve my desired goal that we can then say, I'm having effective communication because I've created a metric. I've created a standard to say, I want my conversation to result in this. And then I can say, did it or did it not, right? Like those are very simple yes, no questions. And if it did, then I replicate that behavior. If it didn't, I identify what my mistake was. I loop back, change that behavior and try the conversation again and see how it results with the next person. Do you apply these principles when you're disciplining your child? I'm not nearly as perfect as I want to be, but yes, I definitely try to. I have the benefit of my wife is also a master degree bilingual educator, right? So she knows a lot about childhood development and communication. I think for those type of communications, child communicating with a child is very different than communicating with an adult, just right off the bat. So I think from that aspect, no one is an expert in it unless you've really gone through those kind of either doing it day in and day out with a child or you've gone through the courses and things like that. Because I was well-versed in communication, right? But childhood communication is not something I did a lot, right? And I didn't have a good background to pull from because I didn't really have great communication with people as a child. So um, one of the key things I really learned was just because like to me saying not right now to my son is a good answer. But all my son heard was no, right? He didn't understand any reasoning behind it. He just heard me say no. And eventually he's going to get to a place where he doesn't ask me questions if he he feels my response is always going to be not right now, right? The same way as how you're having a conversation with somebody. If you keep closing that door, they're not going to want to be a part of it. So it's the same thing. And kids definitely pick up a lot more on what you do than what you say. So the nonverbal, right, the sighing, the frustration, they see that and pick that up and respond to it a lot quicker than an adult would. When I say respond, when I say pick it up, I'm not saying that adults don't pick it up. I'm saying that most adults will either give you a form of grace or overlook it and just kind of be like, oh, whatever. And then they eventually get to a point where, hey, you've shown too much disinterest. Whereas a kid, they immediately pick that up. Because a lot of kids, you know, younger age are communicating without words for for a period of time. And then they're learning words and they still don't know all the words. Right. So they're they're interjecting body language into that. So, yeah, it's definitely been an uphill journey for me in learning how to communicate with a child. Um, It's been a great one because they also call you on your bullshit like way faster than anyone else. So it's it's kind of cool to see that. That's such a comforting thing to hear from you coming from your four deployments as an army interrogator and with all of your, you know, your seven certifications. I don't even know if you have more or at this point, your degree, your master's, all your experience, your consulting, 
firm, like you are a professional communicator. You are a professional, effective communicator. Yet there are struggles when it comes to disciplining your own kid, when it comes to just communicating with your own child. And that's a little bit comforting because parenting is hard. What what do they, what do people say? It's like, to- especially when it comes to toddlers, it's like dealing with a bunch of tiny drunk adults. <laughs> yeah. Ex- so yeah, kind of mine, mine's just super smart though. And I say every person says that, right? My kid's the smartest, but, but, um, but he's like, he, he communicates. So I will say the one tip that I think every parent should hear is we didn't really baby talk our son and my wife has tons of experience inside of that. So we never really did that. We always held on our same regular conversations and my son has a very extensive vocabulary because of it. Now I've also taught him some crazy words. Like, so he goes around in our kitchen with a Nerf gun saying anarchy anarchy right like like that's probably that that's more so me teaching him how to do that but but still the point being is at three years old we talk to him like he's a regular adult and so he he knows these different words and he understands them and i think that's the other piece is we for whatever reason we think like oh our kid's not going to understand that right well try talking to them and then see if they understand it or don't understand it right it's the same thing in regular conversation right that assessment Create that safe space. And safety can also be, hey, I'm talking above this person. I need to bring it down, right? Like, again, that's ramping up and ramping down, right? So so we can do that and you can do that with your child. And and what's the harm, right? You, you talk a little bit above them. They look at you like they don't understand. And then you bring it down to their level. Like, that's not a bad thing. Now, as you talk to adults, it's a little different, right? They might think you're condescending or an mm-hmm. asshole, right? But again, back to that safety, you have to be willing to say, hey, I didn't mean to do that. That was not my intent. I was trying to do this, right? Open, honest communication. So yeah, I mean, just with with my son, I think that's been one of the most amazing things. And I think that's one of the things that all people, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to raise your kid, but I definitely think that if you talk to them like a regular adult, you'll be surprised how much they actually pick up. Yeah. Just like anything, take it with a grain of salt. And my next question for you was actually, first of all, how old is your son? Three. He's three. Okay. So very young, like definitely too young to be having conversations about, you know, kidnappers, rapists, the birds and the bees, you know, having the sex talk or anything like that. Have you and your wife discussed how you plan to approach your son with those kinds of conversations as he gets older? Yeah. I mean, I would say we actually have some of those conversations with him now, right? They're very different, obviously, but you know, he knows not to go up to strangers and you know, we, from a very early age, we said the word penis with them, right? Like other people would freak out. Like, why are you saying that to your kid? Well, I want him to understand. Like he's got a penis, right? Like, and people should not be touching his penis, right? Like it, it, it's stuff like that. That's very obvious. And, and it's just key words again. Like we just said, Hey, like this is that and, you know, certain behavior things, but yeah, as he gets older, you know, the same concept applies. We're going to keep a real adult conversation. You know, we're going to, create that open environment where he can say and ask whatever questions he needs to and where we can give him the answers as best we can. And I think for us, part of parenting is saying we may not know that answer, right? Or we, all we can say is this is what we did, right? So like I have a lot of experience drinking, underage drinking, drugs, all these different things, right? From growing up in a very rebellious environment. So if my son comes to me and asks those questions, I'm not going to say, oh man, I was a saint. I never did those things, right? Like like one day my son's going to hear this podcast and hear that I had an affair on his mom, right? And I'm going to be able to have that honest conversation and say, here's why I did it. I'm not justifying my action, but here's why I did it. And here's what I want you to know about that decision I made. And here's why I don't want you to follow the same path as me. And And I think that's the biggest thing is helping your child understand that while they put you on a pedestal, you're not perfect. And it's okay not to be perfect because if you can show them it's okay being imperfect, then they can go into life and address the areas where they're not perfect. They can take action to become better. And they realize that no one is perfect, right? Because you're not giving them those unreal expectations to live up to. I think a lot of us as kids can say that we had some pretty unreal, I mean, Growing up as a kid, you know, it was don't cry or I'll give you something to cry about, you know, hide your emotions, right? All these different things. And I think we've come to a place now where the conversations are very different. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that the best way that you can parent is to kind of, you know, do it with grace and do it with honesty and, you know, 
just kind of invest in as much as you can. Speaking of looking up to people, who would you consider one of the greats in any of the industries that you've been in? That is a hard one. There are a lot of greats. I will say there is a warrant officer and he's still a really great friend of mine. His name's Aaron Hinnigan. And he, you know, taught me when I was a young interrogator. He has been a part of my life. He's met me and my wife when we were at our darkest. He was there for us. Like he's been a great mentor, a great friend, and he's now a CW5 in the military. You know, a technical expert in interrogation. He's done it through, you know, multiple wars. He's he's a great example. I think Outside of the military, as I started to transition, Rich Cardona and Rob Renz are two people that are doing some amazing things in the transition space to help people. Rich has a podcast, uh, The Leadership Locker, really great guy. I look up to a lot of what he does. He motivates me. Um, There was another person who was a soldier uh, in the MARSOC teams, and I won't say his name just because he's still actively doing stuff in crazy places, but he, you know, he helped me kind of understand that excellence mentality and kind of the special forces way of thinking. And that was huge. Um, Eric Quorum is, you know, he hosts the blueprint. He's a doctor in, in um, you know, sports medicine and, and all kinds of like high performance athletes and things like that. And he is super motivational. I know like you said one, but like, I'm just rattling off all these people. Oh no, it's totally cool. Like it's just a phrase, one of the greats. Right. I mean, but, and I asked for different industries. So, you know, like for me, someone who's considered one of the greats in my industry, I could, I could list a couple of people who I really look up to and learn a lot from. So I really appreciate you like paying tribute to all these different people who have affected you. And I think you have to, right? Like, I think part of growth is realizing that, you know, as much as I like to say, I made it on my own, right? Like I didn't know, I didn't know anybody, anything. And I came up. Well, that's true. While that's true to a certain degree, I worked on my own and I did this. There were tons of people in my life who had meaningful impacts and there were people who had meaningful negative impacts, right? Like I could list off the not greats in my industry and each of them taught me how to be better, right? Like there's an NCO to this day. I cannot stand him. And, you know, I just, his way of leadership, his way of communicating, he was an interrogator, could not stand him then, cannot stand him now. But truth be told, I've learned more from him than any other person. And I would probably never tell him that to his face um, just because he'd take it as he's a great guy. But truthfully, like just the way that he did things, I never wanted to be. And that pushed me to a different level. And it still pushes me, right? And if I take it back all the way to high school, like There was a guy, you know, his name was Mr. Ireland and he was a math teacher. I have a degree in statistics and in high school, they said I'd never be good at math. And he said, that's false. You'll be as good as you want to be at math. And I became good at it. That's an important thing to tell a kid. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And then, you know, my most recent guest, Susan Ramirez, she's the CEO of Austin Angels. And, you know, we talked on Real Talk the other day. And she's just doing amazing things in the foster care industry. And that's totally outside of my space, but it's something that I grew up in. And what she's doing now is something I wish I had when I was a kid inside of that, you know, and she's just a great leader and a great person. And, and I think that's the, the big thing is we should take time to celebrate those people, right. And and tag them, you know, if it's on Instagram, tag them in a post, you know, like, cause they may not know it. And just like you honor them, yeah, honor them because there's days that, Honor and respect. Exactly. And there's times where they want to like give up and quit and they have bad days just like anybody else, right? So you, if you just hold it in that this person motivates you or inspires you, you're doing them a disservice and you're doing a self, yourself a disservice because you will feel so great when you recognize them. You will grow to a new level and there's no telling what that person's interaction or response would become, right? So so maybe you you men, you're mentored from afar by them, right? And you see them and you start commenting on stuff. Then all of a sudden they start connecting with you and messaging you back. And now all of a sudden you have a you have an actual mentor, right? Like this person you never thought would be in your circle, in your world is now in your world. So I think that you know, we we just we get so overwhelmed with everything on social media and this and that and you know, we want to have this I did it on my own you know, no one, no one truly does it on their own. I mean, my wife is the reason that I'm not rolled over in a ditch somewhere. Right. So 
if you want to take it down to its very core, the reason I even have a podcast, the reason I even have a consulting business, right, is because my wife believed in me when no one else did, because I would have blown it out. I would have like blown my brains out had she not, you know, so, so truthfully, like, she's not in my space. She's not in the same industries I'm in. We've completely different degrees, completely different, like interest and everything else. But, you know, she's a fundamental part of why I am who I am, why I'm the dad that I am, you know, and so I think, if we don't take time to recognize those people and say those things, man, it just, and it, and it hurts you because you, just like keeping bad things bottled in, keeping good things bottled in is not good either, right? Like you got, you got to let it out. It's all pressure. It all builds up. And if you're not letting it out, it's just like doing things in there. And that's, that's not what you want. Thank you so much for paying tribute and honoring the people in your life who have had such a great impact on you. I have wholeheartedly enjoyed learning more about you and having this discussion, where can people find you? Yeah. So, um, the biggest thing I have going on is my podcast, real talk with Roman. Uh, every week we talk with guests. You can find me on Instagram, real talk with Roman, um, pretty much anywhere else, right? Roman Roberts. If you look me up, I'll pop up, uh, Facebook, real talk with Roman, LinkedIn, real talk with, or just Roman, right? But you can also search the hashtag Real Talk with Roman anywhere. It's that simple. If you can remember Real Talk with Roman, you can find me. And then uh, Blue Sphinx Consulting is my consulting business. You can check that out online, bluesphinxconsulting.com. And, you know, I just, I, like I said, I love having conversations. I love talking with people, growing and learning. And, you know, feel free to reach out to me on any of those platforms and I will respond as quick as I can. Do you have any projects that you would like to give our listeners a call to action to? I don't, but I'm going to give everyone a challenge. Ooh. I know, right? You should all be trying to be better communicators. So I think it goes back to those three pieces, right? Figuring out how to plan your conversations, figuring out how to have safe conversations, and figuring out how to review your conversations. So take it simple. You know, go through your day. If you, you know, talk to somebody in the drive through of Starbucks, did you get the desired result? If you talk to your spouse, did you get the desired result, Right. And start seeing, is that matching the type of person you want to be? If you want to be a standoffish asshole, right? Like, is that the type of communication style you're exhibiting? If you want to be kind, but you're you're just uh, gruff and mean, like, you know, maybe you need to work on that. So I think I would challenge anyone not so much to to focus on my stuff while my, po- my podcast is great. Love for you to listen. Um, I, I want everyone to be a better communicator. So really and truly start doing that. Start thinking, what type of conversations do I want to have? Am I achieving that goal in my conversations? And am I doing that by creating safety? Because really and truly, none of us should be trying to take safety out of the conversation. Industry Explorers is the podcast for the young adults who have no idea what they want to do after graduation, the undecided majors, the burnt out workers considering a career change, and everyone else in between. With that said, do you have any last minute words of wisdom for our listeners, Roman? Oh, yes, definitely. Get better at communication, obviously. But start understanding the documents that you're signing, the people that you're interacting with and do the research, do the planning, just like you plan the conversation, plan your industry, plan what you want to be. If you're in high school and you're thinking about the military, look into it. If you want to be a lawyer, look into it, right? And start right now, everyone. If you're not on LinkedIn, create an account. If you're in high school, create an account, get on there, start following the lawyers, just literally go into the search bar. And if you say, I want to be a lawyer when I grow up, type in the word lawyer and add every single lawyer you can, because then you can ask them questions. You can see what they're posting. You can understand their mentality, right? Like that may not be you fully, what your thought patterns are, because we're all different, but you're going to get an idea for it. And just like listening to these podcasts will help you understand it. Now you're putting that into your daily routine and you're seeing that day in and day out. So it'll either tell you like, yes, this is what I want to be, or you're going to be like, no, this is not what I want to be. And if nothing else, it gives you people to reach out to for recommendations, for a better understanding of that industry. So yeah, utilize LinkedIn. I think it's underutilized platform. I think it's been underutilized. It's starting to get more utilized, but there's still a lot of reach on it. And I think there's a lot of reach for the high school and young adult crowd because there's not many of them on, right? So if some of them pop on and start asking those questions or showing that interest, I feel like the community would wrap around them because that's the future generation. And people inherently, for the most part, want to help the future. And so take advantage of that. Take advantage of of people's character. 
Roman, it's been super awesome having you on this podcast. I want to thank you so much for sharing all of your experiences and giving everybody so many great pieces of advice and tips that they can use in the future. And for everybody, I hope that you really enjoyed this podcast. Be sure to subscribe, download it, like it, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you can find Industry Explorers. And until next time, I will see you on our next adventure. Take care. Take what you learned from today's expert and play. You heard me. Go play. Just try something new because that's the best way to discover your passion and purpose. If you found the episode insightful, give Industry Explorers a five-star rating and tell us what you learned in your review. Subscribe to Industry Explorers on YouTube for more adventures. Industry Explorers is made possible by the support and contributions from explorers like you. Thanks for listening. I'll see you on our next adventure.